friends, I guess I decided I wasn't quite done with the cinematic universe of superheroes and thought I'd dip my toes in with the other two idiots. So I've actually been asked my thoughts on both of these movies fairly frequently and it just so happened that I hadn't seen either. I was sick when the Marvels hit theaters and I was never gonna pay money to see Aquaman. And seeing as Aquaman and the Last Kingdom marks the end of the DCEU before James Gunn starts over and the Marvels, you know, kind of feels like it should potentially be the end of the MCU in a way, that was joke, don't hurt me, things are just going a little rough for them. Obviously Thor 4 was the sign that they should have stopped. I thought it might be fun to compare the two. Both dealt with extensive reshoots that increased the already very high production costs, and both seemed to not be very good. Now it is kind of an interesting thing because I feel the need to say that it seemed like some outlets were being like a little bit overly harsh towards the Marvels, which I kind of thought just looked like a cute little passable action movie while potentially giving Aquaman 2 a bit more of a pass even though it seemed pretty likely to be an unsatisfying fizzle to a, pardon the pun, dead in the water franchise. Obviously a lot of the Marvel's hate was inevitable. People have consistently been hating on Brie Larson for about five years now. There's the get woke, go broke crowd that uh, think anything that performs poorly at the box office with any amount of diversity uh, is because of that diversity. Totally ignoring all the movies and pieces of media that are loaded with that kind of stuff that perform super well and are very good pieces of media. Like yes, there is obviously nuance to bring to the idea of like pandering, especially the way that Disney panders to some viewers, but uh, the movie wasn't out yet uh, and there are many other ways to criticize Marvel other than throwing out some really lame tagline. I think we should all just switch over to if you try to pander, you might not get as many ganders. Yeah, that sounds dumb as fuck, but so does the other one. But like I said, there are plenty of very valid reasons to not have been hyped for the Marvels and kind of been primed to expect it to be bad and that's because Marvel hasn't been doing very well lately. And Aquaman was just kind of neutral. Like I do feel like people expected it to be bad, but there were definitely some people excited. There's some people that just probably really enjoyed this movie. And a lot of people were gonna support it no matter what, because they were like very upset that James Gunn is taking over and just wanted to support the existing franchise. And obviously, this was a sequel to a movie that a lot of people did like. But I thought it looked like a big stinker, and instead of just doing a video on each of these movies individually, I just decided to cover them both at once and figure out which one is better, subjectively, according to me. Why make decisions when you can just do both? Now before we go into this, I will be candid about a couple things. As mentioned, I did think the Marvels looked really cute. Everyone was shitting on it, and I at least thought it looked fun without really caring about where the MCU is at anymore, and mostly just being afraid for what's store for the X-Men, my little angels. And on the Aquaman side, I must be candid in my unpopular opinion of not loving the original. To me, it kind of felt like watching a video game and not in a satisfying way. It felt like a movie version of Uncharted that's also just making you watch all the parts that you should be in control of because it's just mindless actions or things that would be fun to figure out on your own. I unironically enjoyed the actual Uncharted movie more than the first Aquaman. So much of the middle of this movie is just, oh, we have to go here and find the thing. Oh good, we found on the thing. Oh no, the faceless NPC baddies have arrived to kill us. But then doing that like three times because it felt like they didn't know how to get it from one section to the next. That's how I felt watching the new Indiana Jones too. Not fun. There are aspects of that first Aquaman movie that I do like. I, I just found the movie to just not put it together very well. All that rambling was just to point out that there is the potential that I am more primed to think that the Marvels is gonna be a good time, while mainly thinking that they're both just gonna be average at best and I am very ready to get off the cinematic universe ride. But you know what else is primed for a good time? Traveling with today's sponsor, Raycon. Recently I had a flight at five o'clock in the morning that I got about 30 minutes sleep for and I'm gonna have to do it all over again in about a week. So trying to get a little snooze on in the plane is imperative to my sanity. And my go-to for those situations are my Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Over-ear headphones are just impossible to rest on, other earbuds fall out or push all into your ear weird. But just like Goldilocks plopping her butt in that chair, Raycon fit just right. They're flush to the ear so they're easy to lay on and the optimized gel tips make sure they're staying in your ears and feel great for hours. And with the noise isolation mode, general plane noises are barely an inconvenience as I lull myself to sleep with the social network soundtrack. But while I'm in the airport, I need to be a little bit more alert for any kind of like important flight update 
updates, I can just press the right bud to flip over to awareness mode to hear everything going on around me. They're great no matter what the occasion, whether you're working out, running errands, out for a walk, commuting to work, or just lounging around the house. So make sure to click the link in the description down below or go to buyraycon.com slash Jedi to save 20% off your order plus free shipping. So let's start with some basics. Both of these movies are technically sequels to billion dollar movies, though the Marvels is less of a Captain Marvel movie and more of a multi-piece team-up sequel for Carol, Miss Marvel, and Monica Rambeau. The runtime on both of these movies is shorter than their predecessors. Aquaman 2 clocks in at about an hour and 55 minutes of actual movie, including the mid-credits, while the Marvels comes in at an incredibly lean hour and 37 minutes with its mid-credit scene and neither have an end credit. But then it's kind of in a weird place where I feel like the Marvels could probably have used another 10 to 15 minutes and Aquaman probably could have shaved off 5 to 10. Both could have stronger plots though, which is not remotely surprising based on the number of reshoots and test screenings both of these movies had. Who knows how long the Marvels originally was before they were like, you know, let's just speed run this one. And when we don't know everything that was changed outside the bad test responses, I know that a lot of the Aquaman reshoots were because they wanted to have Batman involved. First it was going to be Keaton, but they had to switch that up because Aquaman was going to end up coming out before The Flash, so I guess they reshot it all with Ben Affleck, but then The Flash did end up coming out before Aquaman, and they still ended up canceling everything with Batfleck because there was no reason to set up for a future that wasn't happening anymore. And while reports stated numerous rewrites and reshoots were necessary after Aquaman test screenings, James Wan denies that, so who knows? Either way, those leaner run times were a, a welcome development for me. So before diving into my personal battle here, I guess just a very light blurb on the plots. Uh, obviously there are going to be spoilers in this video. So in the Marvels, they're teamed up to stop a Kree leader from siphoning resources from planets Carol cares about to restore their home world because she's the one who set its destruction in motion. So it's a little bit of a revenge slash redemption type story. And in Aquaman, Arthur needs to team up with his scorned brother Nemesis to stop Black Manta from destroying the earth and everything Aquaman loves with some ancient element fuel that emits wild amount of greenhouse gases. So it's a little bit of a revenge slash redemption type story. Oh yeah, I found a way to connect these suckers thematically. Obviously there is a lot more going on, I just wanted some light basics out there before we dive into characters. Now on that front, Kamala takes the cake out of everyone here for me, but Arthur is a fun guy too. I do really like Carol Danvers, I know a lot of people don't, but I like Brie Larson, I like her smirky charm to the character, I'm great with it. I think Monica is really cool, but I do wish she had gotten to do a little bit more in areas so you feel a little bit more connected to her. I do think they've kind of neutered Nick Fury here, uh, either because Sam Jackson wanted to be a little bit more of a vacation dad in this installment. Are you praying? Don't stop! We need all the help we can get! Hi, hi, hi. Or that's just what they wanted. Either way, I'm cool with it. The baddie was okay, not the best, but nowhere near the worst. The main issues with her is that her grievances are all things that happened off screen, so I just don't care as much, but I will say I am more connected to like what's going on in that storyline, so it gets points for that. I just don't necessarily care about this villain. The Khan family is great. Goose is perfect as always. No notes. So over to Aquaman, I really like Arthur. He's fun. I'm down to just let Jason Momoa do what makes him happy with the character. I believe that he's super into the environmental aspect of the character, but he is but one part of this tale and most of the other characters are just kind of fine, uh, but mostly entirely forgettable too. Uh, there's some Atlanteans that are just like, around, they do some quips, they remind you of things that happened in the last movie, and I feel like I know nothing about them and don't care to learn. His dad's a pretty cool dude, but mostly here for babysitting and drinking. I actually really like Mara as a character, but she's been nerfed here in a lot of ways outside a couple scenes, one of which is her changing a piss stream to hit Arthur in the face. She's also one of the few people who actually feels threatening in this movie. <laughs> Oh, shit. Ah! Nicole Kidman kind of creeped me out in this. I don't really know why. Uh, probably the eyes. I don't like it. She's fine, though. She's mostly just around to be like, my boys protect each other. I love you. Sorry. Then we obviously get the return of Orm, and I'll get into some specifics with him later, but yeah, they have some solid bro time. They really hash things out. How Orm assumed Arthur actually wanted to steal the throne from him, and that's why he went just a little bit overboard. You know, just a smidge. If you if you weren't such an asshole, you'd still be king. 
Arthur and Orm together are absolutely the highlight of this movie. I love it when you have like a more stiff traditional character played straight, bouncing off a more goofy sarcastic guy. Over to the baddies, our central conflict is with Black Manta, once again seeking revenge on Aquaman for the death of his father, but this time looking for some extra help from Atlantean technology. And as we saw at the end of the last movie, he has Dr. Shin to help on these expeditions, who is fine going along with this revenge plot because he just really wants to see Atlantis. Which I totally get. If Atlantis was real, I'd be looking for some questionable underwater voyages as well. But he gets to be around to see the decline of David Kane, who's always been ruthless, but now seems to be a little bit unhinged. I'm gonna murder his family and burn his kingdom to ass, even if I have to make a deal with the devil to do it. And the decline isn't coming from his obsession going too far. Uh, no, it's because of something much more stupid, which we will get to later, that ties in to a baddie I'm not gonna mention right now. Either way, for the most part, Black Manta, pretty cool villain, some fun moments. First you steal your brother's throne, then you steal his woman, Aquaman. So it kind of leaves me with a weird dynamic that like overall, I think I prefer David Kane as a villain, but I prefer why the baddie is doing what they're doing in the Marvels. So I guess just character to character, we're giving it to Aquaman. But for the good guys, it's easily going to the Marvels just because of Kamala. Bringing us to the plot. So I think the way I want to do this is kind of just compare the different acts, or at least what I'm going to determine as the acts. So we get the intro setup, the rising conflict, the climax and conclusion. So let's hit the general premise. Up. As mentioned, at their core, both of these movies go back to good old-fashioned revenge with world-ending implications, as they so often do. In the Marvels, Carol is facing the consequences of her choice to destroy the Kree's supreme intelligence. She believed it was going to lead to their freedom, but it actually led to a civil war, destabilized the planet, and essentially made it near uninhabitable. All things that would have been super interesting to see in a movie, but we just get minor blips from her and Darben's memories, which just feels very lazy, and it makes it very easy to see why people might have been a little bit confused confused during some of those early test screenings. So the current leader of the Kree, Dar Ben, is looking to restore Hala while getting revenge on Carol by using the other quantum band to siphon resources from other planets directly to Hala through forced jump points. Sure, but this results in some weird side effects. Maybe if I do this. <laughs> Kamala so much. I just adore that there's someone with powers that loves the Avengers and fangirls over someone she's gonna be teaming up with. Do you guys have a spaceship I could borrow? Or... Kamala, don't talk to them. <gasps> you know my name! It just feels so authentic in a world where all of these heroes have just been commodified. But not bopping around is not the planned revenge. It's actually just an unintended consequence of Carol and Monica touching the anomaly and Kamala's bangle, which has led to their powers creating a quantum entanglement. See, Madam Web? Shoshana from Girls it easily could have hacked her way into every New York City camera and I wouldn't have questioned a thing because we have quantum entanglements over here. But that's basically our setup. Batty is scorned, looking to rejuvenate her homeworld by destroying what Carol loves, entangled powers, new team ups and we'll build from there. Now to Aquaman, he's got a baby now who pees in his mouth and that won't super matter. Well, yeah, the peeing obviously won't matter, but I just mean like the baby itself is just kind of going to be used as a device to increase some tension, which I suppose makes sense. That's probably the only capacity that I'd really want the baby involved. Bops up pulling some Renezme shit on a seahorse. I joke, but Arthur Jr. here actually does have the ability to talk to the fishies, so very exciting for Aquadad. And yeah, his name is actually Arthur Jr. Now they do try to make the intro dynamic and snappy. You think he's on an adventure, but he's actually just telling the baby's stories, which also serves serves to catch us up with what he's been up to, uh, you know, minus all the Justice League stuff. The main update, though, is that Atlantis is just very boring to him. He doesn't feel like he's achieving anything. And nothing really seems to be happening until the Earth's temperature starts to inexplicably spike rapidly, because he obviously has no way of knowing that this is all part of a Manta revenge plot. While trying to power his team with Atlantean artifacts, they stumble upon a black trident in a monstrous Arctic cave that possesses David with some ancient evil promising him the power to defeat Aquaman. Real straight forward stuff here, guys. Can't just be a regular revenge plot. We need ancient evil. So the revenge isn't specifically about destroying Earth, which is happening. They're just stealing and burning vast stores of something known as orichalcum to power all these weapons, which is a super volatile element used as a fuel source and emits massive amounts of greenhouse gases. And apparently it's only taken him five months to cause massive damage. Now at first the Atlanteans just assume that it's humans being extra zealous in their lack of environmental care, so Arthur wants to reveal Atlantis to the top 
outsiders to join resources and reverse the effects. While the other Atlanteans are really hard on the, if we're revealing ourselves, it's because we're eradicating the entire human race. Harsh, we're not all lost causes. So those are the setups and I'm gonna have to give it to the Marvels. Aquaman isn't super interesting so far. I, I do think the body swap fight is super fun and satisfying. I love seeing Kamala geek out when she finds out Carol was in her house. I love seeing Carol panic when she realizes she's been zapped into some home that seems obsessed with her. The way Kamala freaks out about Goose. And then the freaking cat animal! I don't know, it has tentacles! Oh, tentacles! Kamala, where are the tentacles? Kamala, where are the tentacles? It's just the type of dynamic fights I'm looking for while trickling in some deeper information like how the Kree are calling Carol the Annihilator. We know that Carol and Monica still haven't patched things up because Monica isn't ready, very sad. Though right now I will say part of that dynamic is annoying me. I really feel like the movies implied that Carol and Monica's mom were more than friends, but that's fine. Overall, I just thought this was a really fun way to get these characters together on screen and to let you know what's going on with them if you weren't entirely caught up. Aquaman's is fine, it's just taking longer to really get into that main plot and I just find what's going on with the Kree more satisfying. Bringing us to rising tensions. So things heat up in the Marvels when they realize that the Kree are planning to steal the breathable atmosphere from Tarnax, a planet housing Skrull refugees to bring back to Hala. Pretty evil shit guys, very not cash money. And it's a big learning moment for Kamala here too. She's getting everything she wanted but also has to realize that it's not always possible to save everyone. But then Valkyrie shows up in a suit to, you know, bring the surviving scroll to Asgard on Earth, so good for them, I guess. And while we didn't get the Rambo Danvers confirmation, which is fine, it is okay for people to just be friends, there are reports that they cut out a scene confirming that Valkyrie and Carol were at one point an item. Totally get it if they cut it for time, but I would've been fine with a little throwaway line. Especially when an entire secret marriage is about to be revealed, but we'll get there. They realize that the baddie is just gonna continue destroying various plants for their resources, and next up is water. That's some real Earth energy, though. Like, if we could do that, you know we would. Now, you'd think that Earth might be a great choice for water, but no, they're going to Aladna, something that Carol seems very awkward about, and the whole place is weird as fuck. They communicate via singing. And I was real primed to be very annoyed with that if everybody was going to join in, but thankfully Monica let me know that she also thought this was all terrible, and I was justified in wanting to brain myself. And I say that as someone who loves singing, but you know, there's appropriate situations. Like, as much as I love Brie Larson singing... This just didn't do it for me. It is intentionally absurd. They're not trying to play it as normal, but more ridiculously, we find out that Carol helped with some kind of diplomatic issue here, and now she's technically married to their prince. We need to talk. Oh wait, he doesn't have to sing? Yeah, he's bilingual. Decent fights going on here though, fun dynamic. They've been working on building their battle mojo. Kamala's really big on the Marvel's group name and trying to find a code name for Monica. Sadly, they did not succeed in preventing the water theft of Aladna, and now the baddie knows that Kamala has the matching bangle. Where did you get that? My grandma, she sent it to me in the mail. Though not entirely sure why she wants it, she seems to be managing just fine with the one, but more power, I suppose. So now she wants to specifically hunt down Kamala while continuing to destroy everything that matters to Carol. Because she's now revealed to the gang, which I've already told you, that she's the reason Hala is dying and that's why they call her the Annihilator. And her guilt is why she didn't go home to be with Monica, which extra sucked because Monica came back from being blipped to find out that her mom died of cancer, leaving her all alone in the world. They make up though, it's chill. But things are looking a little rocky, aren't they? Where we're gonna have to put a little pin in it and we're gonna check in with our Aqua Dad. Again, it's been five months since this trident was found and Earth is just getting shit rocked by spiking temperatures and Manta reveals himself as the one responsible in an attack on Atlantis. Which was just really dumb. It was just to get their store of the Orichalcum, but if they hadn't gone there, they wouldn't have like tipped off their main nemesis that like they were doing bad things and they could have probably, probably just would have worked a lot better if they hadn't given them the heads up. But Arthur believes that the only person that could help them find Manta is Orm. But busting a prisoner out of an allied nation is basically an act of war and would absolutely speed up the process of him losing the throne, so they gotta do a stealth heist. And I love a good heist, except they decided to use Spirit in the Sky while running through it, and I uh, just can't use that song anymore. It instantly makes me think of Guardians of the Galaxy, which is an infinitely better movie, and Guardians only technically used it in their trailer. But it's cool, he's got a cephalopod helper. And if you do see Orm, you tell him that I love him. 
Ma'am, we are on a mission. Maybe we don't have time for that. I will say that this scene is executed so much better and is so much more entertaining than most of the things in the first movie. And as mentioned, I enjoy their dynamic. Arthur just being all, hey, no hard feelings. We'll find you some water soon, pal. You'll be good. I drank it all the way here. What? Bro, it's hot up there. I kind of assumed we were gonna get a brother versus brother fight here, but Orm is just super honorable, and because he agreed to be in prison for his action, he doesn't want to break that arrangement, even though he's being tortured. Honor is very weird. So they obviously make it out and head to some underwater pirate world for a scene that kind of feels like the Gungans and Phantom Menace. Like they even drive in with an underwater vehicle instead of just doing their super swimming. But actually this weirdo looks like a combo of Jabba the Hutt and Dex. But it's just so funny that like when they get to the place that Jabba the Fish tells them about, it's literally a dormant volcano billowing green smoke. There's no way the world wouldn't be like, hmm, oh, maybe that's the cause to all of our rapid temperature spikes. I feel like they could have tracked down that hidden lair without any help and just said they needed Orm because of how strong Manta was getting with the suit. He's going to fight us without the power suit? I told you he's strong now. <sighs> <sighs> But this does lead to Orm having the first-hand view of what's going on with David, flashes of the ancient evil and the lost kingdom. Oh my god, that's from the title! Which means it's time for an exposition dump! Long ago, there was a seventh kingdom that was completely stricken from the records known as Necris, ruled by Atlan's brother, Kordax. And if you thought Orm's imprisonment was bad, wait till you hear what they did to this guy for trying to usurp the throne. They imprisoned him with blood magic! Man, I love blood magic. So because Orm wasn't trying to destroy the planet for personal power, pretty classic tale, Kordax believed that Atlan wanted to steal his power, not stop the Earth's destruction, so he used dark magic to create the Black Trident, which just turned him and his people into monsters for some reason. I don't know, guys, it's dumb as fuck. Big ol' war happens, Atlan's victorious, Kordax and all of Necris is sealed away with his own blood. This evil was supposed to remain frozen for eternity. But David Kane has found it. And all David's gonna need to unleash that great evil is Atlan's blood, which would include Arthur, Orm, and Arthur Jr. I feel like there was just a way to get that blood way faster. Like they knocked out Arthur two times with the sonic cannon thing, but I get it, we need tension. So Manta does manage to kidnap Junior, probably could have just killed him and got a little blood pouch and left his body for Arthur to find, but obviously that's... That's not the type of movie we're watching. What's wrong with you, Amanda? Though I gotta say, the reactions to realizing what happened are hilarious, like Mara freaks out as expected, but then you get this like delayed slow-mo response out of Arthur. No! It's just so bad. All right, obviously that was way wordier than the Marvels because there was a lot more going on and some I didn't even mention. And maybe I just kind of sectioned this off poorly, but that's fine. Again, I'm gonna give this section to the Marvels, though the heist scene beats out a lot of what happens on that end. I just don't like the story we're working with in Aquaman. Possessed baddie is kind of lame. Both of these kind of struggle with backstory events that are more interesting than what's currently happening. So somehow the singing nation is beating the lost underwater kingdom wild. God, that doesn't feel right. Oh well. I feel like my life would have been completely fine never seeing the conclusion of either of these movies. But let's wind into our climax battle anyway. So with the Marvels, our climax obviously involves Earth. And you may be wondering, what could they be taking from Earth if not water or atmosphere? Well, it's our sun. Goody. Wow, both final setups involve a sun. Before then, things get a little bit goofy in the best possible way. Goose is leaving a bunch bunch of flurkin eggs around the ship that is currently going into critical failure from the jump point surges, so while Fury's freaking out assuming they've been sabotaged and these are a bunch of weird little bombs, Boom! Dozens of Fleur Kittens! It's perfect, except for the fact that they're all CGI. And they will be very useful because most of the escape pods are gone and they've already shown us that people can survive inside the Fleur Kitten's stomach somehow. So people are just gonna be hitching rides off the station inside the cats. Attention Saber crew, stop running and let the Fleur Kittens eat you. It's just so fucking surreal and hilarious and maybe it doesn't add anything to the larger plot, but I love it. And I'm sure it had to be one of the most consistently enjoyed scenes in the test screenings, which is why it's still here. I'm sorry. When the door... <laughs> I just love it so much, it's absurd. Just this insane horror-like scenario played to memory by Barbara Streisand. Get it? Because cats. 
So now it's just the Marvels waiting for Dar Ben. And if you're wondering why they didn't just send Kamala away with the bangle, or at least hide the bangle because she doesn't need it for all of her powers, it's because she will need it to close the jump point. After a very uninspired fight, they obviously come out ahead, but they do give Dar Ben a chance to have everything changed. Carol can try to use her powers to reignite Hala's son. But she still wants revenge, immediately gets the upper hand and demands the bangle, even though they all seem to know that her body won't be able to handle it. There's just a lot of bangle science going on here that we're just taken as like, oh yeah, Obviously that's the case. So she basically immediately takes herself out like the chick from Guardians who tried touching the Power Stone once Carol supercharges the bands. Bringing us to the real problem, her exploding carcass blasted a hole between multiverses. Because of course that's a thing. So the only solution is for Carol and Kamala to generate the same amount of energy again, have Monica absorb it and release it from inside the tear to repair it. Scientifically sound, I am sure. Now if you're wondering why the bands aren't killing Kamala, it's because she's kind of like born for them and they just enhance her dormant power she already has. Now immediately I was thinking, okay, how does Monica get out of the hole after? And yeah, obviously she doesn't. She's stuck in another dimension. Very sad, but at least the Earth is safe. No thanks to the Eternals. You think someone trying to steal the sun might be the occasion to pop out for, but no, I guess Drew is just a little bit too busy naked dancing around his grand estate. Watch my saltburn video. We call that cross promo. But back to Aquaman where the baby is on the chopping block. Now, Dr. Dr. Shin's been trying to escape for quite a while now, and he's very much not into murdering babies, so he sends their location to the Aqualads. I've dreamed of this. Two of you standing together as brothers. Promise me you will protect each other. No time for this, ma'am. A baby's about to be murdered. Can you imagine if they like stepped in right when he was getting gutted and it's like, yeah, the difference between that happening and not happening was this speech? Also, I just need to comment. It is hilarious that Orm is her son when Nicole Kidman is only six years older than Patrick Wilson. Anyway, they get there just in time for Necris to get blown open. The monsters start to attack and the baby is actually about to get gutted. Obviously that doesn't happen, but Orm does end up possessed by Cordax when trying to save Mera. So shit's really going down now. It's Arthur versus Possessed Orm who is significantly stronger than Possessed Manta and Cordax is released from slumber with a little bit of blunt force trauma. But through the power of happy memories that just happened, Arthur pulls Orm out. But it's too late, the baddie's on the move. And while Cordax is still rambling on about his freedom, Arthur just launches the trident at him. And I was like, damn, if that works, that's lazy, but also hilarious getting the baddie when they're going on their power trip diatribe. But no, that would be too easy. <laughs> Shit. Except Arthur then just immediately throws his own trident and does kill Cordax. So fuck, it really was just that easy. And it would have been so much more satisfying if he just did it in the first time, because then at least it would have been like funny and not, you know, uh, the runtime's getting a little bit long and there's a lot of VFX around him fighting. So let's just kill him. Ending off with Aquaman trying to save David, the thing he didn't do for Manta Sr. But then he just decides to yeet himself off the cliff instead. Cool, cool. Sick. Okay, for the actual battles, I'm gonna just say that neither of these were super satisfying. It was pretty obvious that Monica was gonna get stuck on the other side, but she's probably fine. At least where she's getting stuck should be pretty interesting as I'll get to momentarily. But I still think the Kree plotline as a whole is much more satisfying, even if it would have meant more to actually see some of that happening. A lot of what Carol did off screen is more interesting than what actually happens in this movie. But that cat scene alone is just so damn delightful for me. It probably could have been in the last section two, but this is actually the final battle setup. I'm also sure there's a lot of people who hated that scene, but I adored it. It brought me so much joy. It wins the round. To be fair, I rarely like ending battles unless they're really dynamic and fun or just like shot in an interesting way or like brutal or like really do something with like the character's development. There, there's really interesting ways. There's really good ways to make interesting fights. And I just don't really think either of this did that. Uh, so they're pretty even here, but I will say that Aquaman has a much cooler location, so I guess I will give it the nod for that. That's just for the final battle though, the cats still take the round. But before we call it, let's check out those endings. So with the Marvels, Carol keeps her promise to reignite Hala's son, which you know, she just kind of like flies through it. You think that would actually explode it, but whatever, they're fine. The other planets are somehow making a full recovery even though their resources were siphoned off. Then she 
finally settles back on Earth, waiting till they find Monica. But the real exciting moment is the beautiful tease for the Young Avengers, which I want to see so bad. I love the street-level heroes. One of my favorite things that Marvel's done since Endgame was the Hawkeye television show. I get that Kamala is like a lot more than street level, but like she's still a teenager. I just think the dynamic would be fun. Like my favorite piece of superhero media is probably X-Men Evolution. So if I could just get a live action version of that, I'd be happy as shit and this might be the closest I ever get. But speaking of the X-Men, our mid credit scene. Monica wakes up in a hospital to see her mom fully healthy, but her mom has no idea who she is because this clearly isn't her mom in this universe. And then Beast walks in. And yeah, it's Kelsey Grammer, but looking like absolute shit. You gotta do practical, guys. I know it's annoying, but this looks atrocious. You can't do it for a feature length film. You can't do it. Stick the hair to that man. You sign up to be Beast, you sign up to be spray painted. But there it is, the X-Men, potentially the ones right out of the Fox movies, at least confirmed to exist in an alternate universe, which makes sense for why they haven't popped up yet officially in the MCU. I kind of would have preferred this to be a blank slate. I guess I don't know what's gonna happen, but we obviously know that Deadpool and Wolverine are gonna tear shit up in a movie that'll connect to the MCU, so it is coming. I just really hope they don't massacre my babies. Still pretty hype for me though, definitely more so than Aquaman. So they make it out alive, Orm gives him a King Pep talk, and Arthur lets him pretend to have died so he can live a free life. Before Arthur big dogs it and properly introduces Atlantis to the world, like he goes to like governing bodies and United Nations and stuff, and how they can all join in together to save the Earth, which is nice, but feels weak, because the reason it got so bad was because of an ancient non-existent fuel that we as humans obviously had no control over, uh, and then they have Atlantean technology to help fix it, so we don't have to do anything, but yeah, woo, environment. Closing it out with what 100% seemed like a nod to Iron Man? I am Aquaman. Oh no, don't compare yourself to the movie that did the superhero thing significantly better than you 15 years ago. That moment marked the start of what was gonna be their grand franchise that they stuck the landing to, and this is the end of your sputtering failure. But honestly, that would have been a nice little closeout for the DCEU, ending with a call out for humanity to be better for the future of everyone. Uh, then it gets a mid credit scene. And if you don't like bugs, heads up for this next little section. Earlier in the movie, Arthur tells Orm that cockroaches are a delicacy and Orm enjoys eating one. So the last thing he does is pick one up off the table, put in the burger he's finally trying and eats it. That's how the DCEU ends, guys. Someone eating a cockroach. Okay, uh, wow. Well, as much as I hate CGI beasts, the post-credit nod absolutely has to go to the Marvels. But I think the conclusions here are pretty even. Like you get some nice character growth with Arthur and Carol. You know, Arthur is stepping up to be the king he wants to be. Again, I think the Marvel's issue is that there's just a lack of connective tissue for a lot of the growth we're getting and a lot of the backstory we're getting. In terms of which movie I think is better, I've, I've gotta go with the Marvels. Again, neither of these movies is amazing and outside a couple scenes in the Marvels, they just don't hit in the same way the other classic installments that we love. And I really think that just comes down to people making movies with the intent of making a bunch of money versus actually caring about the stories being told, which interestingly is just resulting in them making less money. Obviously, I understand making money is important. That's always gonna be someone's job to worry about, to worry how to market a movie. But the number one important thing should be what is gonna make people wanna watch this movie? Movie, and how do we deliver that in the movie? I talk about a lot of this stuff pretty extensively in a video about the state of the big two with a heavy dose of the Flash and Blue Beetle, but I don't think there's a specific superhero fatigue. I think it's bad superhero movie, connected universe, and multiverse fatigue. When DC is making standalone movies, they're really good or at least stronger than what they delivered on the main front. When Sony execs don't care as much about meddling in a movie, you end up with something incredible when it's left to the right people. There's clearly no shortage of enjoyment for the boys and in Invincible. So while this fizzled ending of the DCEU is sad and honestly, probably about five years too late at least, I'm happy that they're starting with a fresh slate and I still get my Bat Pat movies. Honestly, if I was James Gunn though, I wouldn't be making connected universes. I would just be focusing on making really good standalones. And I hope that that's gonna be their aim, that they make the really good standalone movie. And if you can connect them, down the line, great. I will say Marvel's a little bit more sad. They pioneered this connection 
connected universe of superheroes and did it so well, but now they can't stop trying to one-up themselves, which just isn't possible, so every project just feels like it's in limbo until they get something to stick. Finding out that they were surprised the Eternals didn't perform well was astounding to me. Marvel thought that movie was going to be like really, really well reviewed. They lifted the embargo really early and they also put it in some fancy movie festivals. And I think the only real way out is taking things back to basics, which they just don't seem super willing to do in a meaningful way. Look, at this point, just make a great X-Men movie and worry about tying it in later. Same for Fantastic Four. I still don't believe these movies deserve the level of hate they got, especially the Marvels, but they also don't need me doing defense because they are multi-million dollar studios and they should learn to fix their own mistakes. But I'm still giving the win to the Marvels because of the cats. No, I do just genuinely think it was a more entertaining movie. Like if you're not gonna successfully tug at my heartstrings, I at least wanna be taken by surprise and Cats Eating People to Memories by Barbara Streisand certainly did that. I just had a really hard time staying engaged for most of Aquaman outside that heist scene and it just felt clunky and wasn't all that interesting. I just feel like we're too far along for this kind of stuff. Again, the Marvel suffers from some of that as well, but I just thought it was a better executed movie with a more interesting conflict. But yay, congrats to the Marvels. You're the winner of the losers and now it's time to make better movies with more realistic budgets so it won't be seen as such a colossal failure when you only make a couple hundred million dollars. I don't know what the point of any of this was anymore, but I hope you enjoyed. Yeah, let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. Um, obviously this style of video probably isn't gonna be a very common thing unless there's like a very good reason to be comparing them. I just thought that, you know, these came out at similar times. I've been asked about them a lot. Figured I'd just wrap them up in one go video. So let me know what you guys are thinking down below. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We are getting dangerously close to 600,000 subscribers. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All my social medias are listed down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.